So Julie, this is Julie Floyd, who is the parent of a young man who has Bar syndrome and an educator. And we're very thankful to have her tonight to make a presentation about educational issues that are relevant to children who have Bar syndrome. And Julie, we thank you for being here tonight and take it away. Okay, Shelly, thank you so much. And you guys, thank you for being here and for those who are listening to our recording at a later time. Um, I wanted to share with you guys this, this evening um, some different things in terms of students who may be in a school setting, whether that be a private school, a public school, a small school, a large school, um, and some things that uh, might be helpful when you are deciding the best course of action for your child's education because that is such an important piece of what we do as a parent is making sure that our child gets um, an appropriate education and for our boys with bar syndrome at times that can present some special challenges and so as a parent and especially as a parent who might not have a background in education it's important to know what your rights are and and what is appropriate to request and ask for to meet the needs of your son so with that said, and I am able to see the chat box for those who are here. If you do have any questions as I go along, I'm happy to stop at any point. Um, you guys know I'm a pretty informal person, so um, you know, don't hesitate to ask me to clarify or to slow down or whatever the case may be. So um, now my presentation has frozen again like it did when we tested it a few moments ago. So. <laughs> Okie dokie. All right, there we go. So I just wanted to start out by saying that, you know, as a parent from the from the very moment that our child is born, and maybe sometimes even before they are born, we have dreams uh, for our children and what we want to see them become and what we want uh, them to have access to and to be able to meet all of their hopes and dreams. And, you know, as little children, our sons and daughters, come to us with all types of things that they want to be when they grow up and and when it comes down to it really all we want is to see our children have full lives and to be able like I said to, to reach those goals and dreams that they might have for themselves and so it really becomes um, an issue of as a parent putting all of those pieces of the puzzle together to make sure that our sons with bar syndrome have exactly the same opportunities as any other child in our school setting to be successful and and to develop those skills and um, and pieces to make sure that they are ready to go into every phase of their life so when is it too early you know I have parents ask me this a lot when I begin thinking about what education is going to look like um, when should I start to talk to the local school or when should I consider whether I'm going to go small school, large school, public school, private school. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't know that it's ever, ever too early to begin thinking about that, but you definitely want to make sure for that full year before your child is going to actually be going to school that you start a communication with whatever, you know, you, you are planning to do for that that first year. You want to start talking with the people in that school, whether it's the school counselor or um, an, another representative of the school. Because as, as you guys have probably already learned, um, if you walk in and say that, you know, your child's going to be coming to school and your son has bar syndrome, it's not like you see a look of recognition in the eyes of the people at school. So it's very challenging at times to make sure that we are advocating for our sons but also educating the people who are going to be educating him and um, this is something that I personally definitely have dealt with and, in, and at the beginning of each year still do even though uh, my son is very well known at his elementary school and it's an elementary school of about 1300 kids um, you know to them he looks like a very healthy active funny boy and, and so it's very hard for them to understand that there could be issues and that there are things that need to be in place to make sure he's supported um, at every moment while he's there at school. And, you know, as a parent, if we were only able to see what the future holds, I know that there are so many times as a parent that I just wish I knew um, 
you know, what was in store and what I could do to better prepare him for that. And, you know, what steps could I take now that might make that easier for him? And, and it's just not going to work that way. <laughs> for any of you who are planners like I am, boy, I sure would like that crystal ball. But um, we, we just have to go with what we know at the time and make the best decisions and know that at times we may have to step back and, and reevaluate. And I think that if we are all honest with ourselves and we all, you know, we all probably have a little bit of a different view of parenting and what, you know, how we do things in our families and for our children. But I think when you get down to the basics, all of us have the same hope and dream. And that is for our child to be able to be successful in school and in life in whatever that least restrictive environment is. And um, least restrictive environment is an educational term. And all it means is that your child is able to be successful in school with the minimum amount of intervention and help as possible. Because the last thing you want to do, and I think sometimes um, this is something we have to be careful of too, um, as a parent of a child who could potentially be medically fragile, is that we don't um, you know, blaze into the school and ask for everything right away for, for our son. Because guess what? He may not need it. So it's really important. This is one of the most important things actually to me um, to get across to you guys as a, a parent who has been through several years with my children in school and then also as an educator for what, whew, 22 years now, um, is that you want to start out with the least amount that it takes to support your son. And then if things need to be added or redeveloped or tweaked or changed, you can always um, do that. But we really want to look at what that least restrictive environment is and go with that. So what I want to address tonight, I want to start with that um, least restrictive environment and look at what your options are in terms of interventions and accommodations at school. So obviously the, the very least restrictive environment would be the regular classroom with all classmates at all times with absolutely no special attention or regard at all in terms of anything. And so just like any other kid in the class. Um, but we know for our sons that sometimes that that's not possible. And so there are um, three different levels that I just want to introduce you to tonight and, and see if you have any questions. Um, that are possible levels of intervention that a school can offer um, for any child who has any type of special need, whether that be, um, you know, it may be a physical need because of a medical condition, it could be um, an emotional need, or it could be a cognitive need, you know, because of some type of um, learning disability or just processing issue. There's just a variety of things. So that, that, bottom tier of intervention, depending on where you're located in the country and what type of school setting you're in, some schools will call this a student support team. And it's becoming more common these days to hear this called RTI, Response to Intervention. And what this is, is a documented team who comes together to look at a student who might need some type of special intervention or treatment and they follow this child and um, they document what this child might need and they list out carefully what the school is going to do, what the parent's going to do and so forth. And then they track that to see how the student is progressing, if there are any issues, if any other support needs to be put into place. And typically the, the team in this case is going to be similar to other teams and it's going to be the parent and the teacher, the counselor, maybe an assistant principal um, and maybe the child depending on the age of the child. And RTI, or student support team, is meant to be fairly um, temporary, if you will, um, not a permanent solution, but um, can a lot of times be used situationally when a child might need some type of intervention. And um, for my son, his first year in public school, this is what he had. He had what was called um, an SST, a SST, student support team. And that was really all he needed for his kindergarten year was just that, and his first grade year, was just that minimal amount of intervention. Um, and we'll talk about some possible accommodations that can be asked for. Um, but while this is binding, I mean, the school's going to do what you come up with in this. Um, it's, it's very um, 
minimally invasive, if you will. It's a very informal um, but binding type of meeting that happens to, to help a child in school. The next level of intervention is what's called a 504 plan. This is something that more of you have probably heard of. And um, the sec Section 504 plan is um, a plan that is federally mandated and, you know, by law, a school, once a 504 plan is written, a school must meet the conditions that are put forth by the team. And a 504 plan just steps up that level in of intervention a bit, just to make it as simple as possible for you guys. Um, the 504 plan um, can address a variety of physical needs, um, some um, academic needs that might occur, but primarily more physical needs that are, are needed in a classroom. And we'll talk more about this in just a second. And this is what um, this is what my son actually has in place at his school, and it works beautifully. He has um, a 504 plan. And then lastly, the most invasive um, and the most detailed type of plan that can be in place to help a child is what's called an individual to edu individualized education plan or an IEP and this is actual um, actually done through special education um, and the Individuals with Disabilities Act. You may have heard of IDEA. Um, whereas the RTI and a 504 plan are not governed under special education law. Um, the IEP is. So if we look at what these different levels of intervention have in common, all of them meet the needs of special learners, but just in different ways, as I was saying when I introduced this to you. Um, so it's important to look at your child and what is realistic in terms of what he needs to be successful in school. And if your son is just starting school, you may not know right away. It may be a situation where um, you have some, some basic safety nets in place, but that you wait and see how things go um, and see how he does in school. Because I know it's been so important to me as a parent to not single out or um, make my son feel different at school that wasn't needed. So there are some times that it's needed, but there are a lot of times that it's not. Because at the end of the day, he just wants to feel like any other kid at school when he can. And I don't know, I, this is a little blurry, but I really liked this cartoon. So I'm not sure if you can see it, but the teacher says to ensure a fair selection, you all get the same test. You must all climb that tree. And as you can see there, there are a variety of um, animals there, including a fish, um, that are being told, you know, that they have to do things all the same. And, you know, it's, it's a lot easier, to be quite honest, for a school if everybody's treated the same. And every school is different, and every teacher and support member in that school is different. So I just encourage you, as you start to navigate the school years, or if you're already in that place with your son, that you step back and remember that you do have rights as a parent and it is important to push when needed to get what you need. Um, I will say that as an educator for a lot of years and as just a, as a school counselor and then as a parent, I will say that you're going to get a lot, lot farther with what you want with kindness um, and sometimes biting our tongue and, and figuring out other ways to get what it is we want. Um, and some of you may have experienced that, but um, it's just so important to advocate. Even if the school setting might seem a bit intimidating or you don't know exactly how things work, um, at the end of the day, it, it, it's your child and, and they're just people too. And sometimes I think they just have to be reminded that um, you know, in all situations, we're gonna do what's best for kids. So I know this is a lot of words here, um, and so I wanted to give you just a little more information about the SST or RTI process. And like I said, this is the least restrictive intervention if interventions are done, and a team does meet for this, and various um, classroom accommodations can be put into place through the SST or RTI process. It's typically reviewed often, like possibly even every four to six weeks, whereas some of the other interventions we'll look at are much more long-term. 
and this is typically the first step towards any type of special education testing. Now, if your son only has issues or potential issues in school with his health condition and there aren't any actual true um, learning issues that are potentially going on, then most times that IEP is not going to be needed. Now, if there are some issues that are going along with the health condition that um, lead you to believe that your child may have some struggles in terms of actually processing information or learning, then obviously, um, especially even the playing field, if you will, for all students. It said Shelly was having some problems. No, I don't want to leave the meeting. Um, are you guys still able to hear me? I can hear you. But yep, I can still hear you. I'm on the phone with Shelly, so we'll, we'll see what's oh, going on. I'm still here, and it's recording. Okay. Okay, that's bizarre. All right, no biggie. So um, that was just a funny screen that, that popped up. So, um, so if we look at a lot of times, in my experience at least, schools want to rush to an IEP before they consider other interventions that might be appropriate. And um, sometimes parents want to rush to that because that's what's familiar. That's what they've heard. That's what they've read about. And by all means, you guys, if that is what is needed to help a child be successful, it is an absolutely, totally appropriate and wonderful thing to do. Um, but just make sure that that is the level of intervention that's needed for your child before you go that route. Um, you know, I'm not questioning any school's ability to decide what's best for a child when they are actually working with that child. But it is important as a parent to keep in mind that schools do receive extra funding for every child who is designated. Um, uh oh, you can't see my screen anymore. I think it's because I'm not a presenter anymore. When something, when whatever happened with Julie, Shelley's connection. I'm going to change you to presenter for some reason. It says you're a presenter, and I'm sorry for this. So I'm going to bring it back over to me, and then I'm going to take it over to you, and I'm sorry about that. And I am changing. No big deal. Over to Technology. You. Yeah, I know. Okay, so I turn it back over to you. All right, I think we're good. Okay, great. So can you guys see my um, screen again? I see it. Awesome. Okay, so all I was saying there was be careful because it may very well be something that's needed for your son, but, you know, at least in public schools, extra funding is given when a child is designated as special education. And so it's just important to make sure that, that what's being recommended and, and done is actually what is needed. So that's my only little tip there for you. Okay, so let me see if I can get, okay. So if we look at the IEP and the 504 plan, they are both federal documents and they are both, you know, schools are mandated to follow both of those. Um, they are required by law, and any item that is put in either one of those types of plans, a school is bound to meet. Um, likewise, anything that's placed in the document that the child is going to do or the parent is going to do is legally binding. Um, it's a team effort in terms of what is put into those documents to best help a child. So if we look at who makes up the team, I think this is really important, especially for people who might not have a background in education because it can be intimidating. You know, I've sat through these meetings as a parent and I've run, I still run a lot of these meetings as a professional and it can be very unnerving for the parent because you feel like everybody's looking at you and you are the voice for your son and you want to make sure you say and do everything just right. Um, like I said, just remember that everybody who makes up this team is a caring professional who is there for a reason because they love children and they're there to help. So please don't, 
you know, try and at least not to let that make you too, too nervous when you do have to go um, and advocate for your son. So who makes up the team? Definitely you. Um, definitely your son, depending on the age. Um, starting last year, my son has been involved each year in his 504 plan meetings. I think it's really important as soon as the child is mature enough to include him in this type of thing so that it's not something that's being done to him or about him, but it's something that he also has input um, into. Um, and that was really important. For, for my little munchkin because he was asked in the meeting exactly, um, he was asked in the meeting exactly how he felt about things. So um, absolutely, Shelly, let me just go through this right here and then I will be quiet. Absolutely, I, I like it when questions are asked as we go along because it may end up turning the direction that things go if I know that there's a need that I'm not talking about. So, um, so the parent, the student, an administrator, the counselor, teacher or teachers, also, if there's a school nurse or clinic worker, um, possibly if your child is going to receive transportation by the school, um, you definitely want to make sure that the bus driver is present for any meeting such as this. Um, and anyone interacting with the child, um, depending on the age of your son, like if they go to specials or exploratories or whatever your school might call them, like art and music and PE, um, you know, those teachers would also need to be present in any type of meeting, team meeting that happens um, to make plans um, for any type of accommodations. Okay, I'm going to be quiet now and please, please, please ask away. I, I have a few questions. Um, I think that the, the um, I, I love the idea of the research, the least restrictive environment as possible. And the other question is, would a parent need to know the term student response team or I, RTI when they go to a school? Or could they just say, I'm not really sure what my son needs and can you help me? I mean, if a family went to the school. I think it's fine to. Oh, I'm sorry. That's it. I mean, if, if a family just said, my son has bar syndrome. I know he has real, real challenges in learning. Can you help me? I'm not sure what I don't know. How is, is the school going to be able to guide them in getting the best direction? About what to do for their boy if they don't know the proper terms. Well, I would like to think so. And I think in most situations, the answer to that is yes, but that's why it's important to know these terms from this um, okay. because there wouldn't be anything else that they should be suggesting. It's going to be one of these three levels of intervention. And they're pretty common terms across the board, regardless of public or private or, um, so, you know, I would, I would try to remember these terms if at all possible. If not, absolutely, just ask the school what they would suggest. But again, just being careful of jumping the gun if it's not needed and going to the most restrictive um, environment, if you will, or the most intensive type of accommodation and documentation if it's not needed. So um, typically, you know, I would say that most of our boys are going to need a little more than RTI could offer just because that that's typically a more short term solution, but mm -hmm. you know, not necessarily. So that leads me to another question. So if a boy wants, to, let's say a boy wants to be with his friends on the playground and he wants to, um, you know, if you, if a family goes to um, an educator and says, my son has bar syndrome and these are the issues or the challenges that he has, he tends to get put in a little glass box and he's protected. And that's not, I don't think what a parent is looking for. What they're saying is, is look out for him, take care of him. But he needs the opportunity to push himself and try a little bit. And, you know, if he's a little bit more challenged than his peers. Um, we're not saying put him in, in into this tinder box, you know, and I think there's a fine line. Is there a way for educators to feel comfortable with a kid who is, is fragile 
Well, I, I don't know that all of the boys with Bar syndrome are, are fragile, but is there a way for them to feel comfortable with it and for a family to say, I don't want my son to be put in a tinderbox. I want him to, to be able to be as normal as possible, but don't, you know, don't protect him too much. And, and the educators feel comfortable with that on a playground. You know, I think that that's an excellent question. And that's a question that we have dealt with and struggled with each year for my son. Um, because quite honestly, each year when we have held his 504 meeting before school starts, um, and some people are, are old hat, you know, like the counselor, the administrator, his bus driver, but it's always a new teacher each year. Um, and that person is always very nervous when they hear potentially what issues William could, fa oops, sorry, um, what issues he could face. <laughs> um, and so I personally think it has a lot to do with how as a parent you approach it and how you make the teacher feel comfortable. It's always been very important that I reiterate to his teachers that you know, he's to be treated like any other kid. Yeah, he may, you know, need a little help because his classroom's on the second floor at the end of the day, or he might get a little tired on the playground, but, you know, let him go out there and have fun. Um, if you have a concern, give me a call. You know, I'll be glad to, to come up and see him or take a look or, or send him to the clinic because, of course, the school nurse has known him since he was in kindergarten. So I think as people in a child's school get to know him better, and I think it, like I said, I think it has so much to do with if you make the staff feel comfortable. Um, if you come across as a parent who is oh, freaking out about your child coming to school, which would be very normal, do not get me wrong. Um, I just think they're looking to us as the parent to see if we are very nervous and high strung about it and, and that's going to sort of color how they react. Um, I will say that there have been many times I've gotten phone calls and emails as a parent when I didn't really need them, but boy, I sure would rather have gotten it and been able to say, it's okay, that's no big deal, than, you know, them not calling or wondering. Um, I know for a fact, because my daughter keeps me informed, and this bothers her greatly, that um, his teacher this year really, really, really keeps an eagle eye on him on the playground almost to the point of not paying attention to the other children. <laughs> mm. um, and that bothers her because she says she's looking out for him. The teacher doesn't need to. Um, but, you know, I also, again, I always um, try to reassure her that all is well. And I even go into my 504 meeting each year and say, I, I literally say this every time, here are the things that could happen. However, I am placing him in your care. I realize something could happen. I realize he could get injured or hurt or he could have an episode uh, with his heart while he's here with you. However, I realize that up front and I want him to have as normal of a life as possible. And I just want you to do everything you can to keep him safe and happy. Um, you know, I think it's important for them to understand that we don't have unrealistic expectations of them as a staff, that we just want you know, them to be professional and, and love our sons and, and let them be as normal as possible. I, I hope that helps. Um, but I, I do think they really look to us with body language and what we say and our facial expressions in terms of how much they should worry, um, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think what I'm hearing is, is that we need to go in and, and make sure that the educators understand that, yes, this is a really um, unusual situation. And our boys, as soon as they hear heart, I think they, they're very concerned and they need to be. I mean, we want them to be cognizant of it. And maybe, you know, with new technology, we need to encourage them to text us, you know, text us, send us an email, whatever, you know, we, we need to do. Let us know what he looks like, what your concerns are, and we'll be there. You don't have to be the person who's the judgment maker. We'll be there for him, but don't treat him like an invalid. Is that Absolutely, because depending on the age of your son, he's going to pick up on that real quick. 
and that's just not a cool thing. Um, so I know my my strategy, if you will, has always been to really scare them the first 10 minutes of the meeting and let them know all the horrible things that could happen to a boy with bar syndrome, but then back off and say, here is where he is right now. Here is why I feel comfortable putting him in your care. I want him to have a great time. I want him to have fun with his friends. And then, you know, you sort of, you sort of go from there. Um, it's, it's just a, a fine line that takes some practice, I think, um, in finding that right mix of, I'm not freaking out, so you don't need to, but this is a very serious issue. Thank you, Julie. Okay, so once you decide what might be needed, so there's going to be a team of some sort, uh, because here is what I do not recommend. I do not recommend you sending your son off to school of any type without having a meeting prior to him attending. Um, whether that be a formal anything or just a, a meeting at the beginning of the year just to document um, what his health concerns might be, even if that's all that you end up needing to do, um, I do not recommend any school year starting for your son without you know, having a face-to-face -face meeting. And as the years have gone on, and my son is now in fourth grade, it's been a little harder each August to get that meeting scheduled because I know teachers have had pre-planning days cut because of furlough days and budget cuts and everything else. Um, and they feel like they know him now and, you know, his mother's probably a little overprotective uh, because nothing's really ever happened except one time, you know, he had a, an issue. Um, but with all that said, um, we were cutting it really close last year, and, and I called the assistant principal and I said, William will not be at school on Monday if we haven't had this meeting. And we miraculously had the meeting um, before the first day of school on Monday because, you know, teachers do change and um, exploratory teachers do change, and I didn't feel comfortable sending him off to school without everybody who was going to come into contact with him knowing. And typically it's something where um, the whole grade level where this child is, you know, wherever your child is, will know. Because sometimes teachers cover for each other. Sometimes teachers, um, you know, out on the playground will help watch each other's classes. And, um, and it, if there's a place in the school where an accident's going to happen, whether your child has bar syndrome or anything, um, it's going to be the playground. It's the most fun place at the school to be, but it's also the most dangerous. Um, and I could not agree more. Could not agree more. Um, and our, our schools are going to look to us to see what normal is, just like our sons are. You know, we, we don't. I work every single day to make sure my son feels absolutely, totally normal in terms of his peers and his school experience as much as possible with his sports experience. I mean, he, he definitely knows there are limitations and things he can't do. But, you know, we try to focus on the things we can do. So, um, so this is who would make up the team. And if you ever have a question and, you know, the school might be saying, well, that person doesn't really need to be there. Mm, no, that person does need to be there. Any person who is going to come into contact and lay a hand on your child at any point during a school day needs to be there. So, um, you know, I hope, I hope that our boys know that they most definitely can participate in sports or intramural activities or anything going on like that. Um, you know, in our personal situation, and I know everybody is different, we've just had to have a talk about what sports might be appropriate because, you know, being a young boy and growing up, it is very normal to be competitive, to want to play hard, to want to win. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. That's a very, very, very normal thing um, for our children as they grow up. I mean, look at how some of us are about our college teams and professional teams. Go dogs, John. Um, so, you know, we get very into these things and we can't expect our boys just because they might um, not ever be professional football players or professional basketball players. You know, it's important that we make sure that we find appropriate outlets um, for them in, in sports. And again, it's totally dependent on 
um, desire, but then also any physical limitations that might be there. In our case, um, you know, when my son was younger, we, we played baseball, and then we got to the point where that was a, that was a little scary for him, so we stopped. Um, and then, you know, we've done some basketball camps, and then we've done golf, because that was an absolutely perfect thing, and he's still continuing with that. And now we're actually playing organized um, in a league flag football, because again, it's just a little bit of a slower pace and not, you know, obviously not as physically um, demanding. So although when some boys pull flags, it's more like tackle football, but so you just have to decide as a family, but it's so important to make sure there's some outlet for that um, because it's an important part of growing up, um, whatever it may be that, that he might be interested in. Um, and I know that's hard. I know it can be really hard because what their dream may be may be a sport that's just not appropriate at the time for him. So, and competition is a part of life. It's never going to go away and it can be a, a healthy thing just so we approach it in, in the right kind of way. Okay, I'm having trouble again with getting my screen. There it goes. Screen locked up, but there it goes. All right, so if you look at when you come together as a team, what might you ask for? Um, in this team as a parent. You know, you might be saying, especially if you've never been in a meeting like this, um, what's appropriate to ask for? Am I going to make them mad? Am I going to make them not like my child? Um, are they going to think I'm crazy? So I just wanted to share this evening, um, what are some of the very common things that are into plans for students that would not shock the school at all and are very, like I said, very, very common. And one would be extra time, not unlimited time. There are two different things. But extra time if it's needed because um, possibly your child gets tired or has to miss school because of illness or uh, maybe it takes him longer to write. Um, and if it's a writing assignment, maybe he just needs more time. Um, maybe it's preferential seating. Maybe that means closer to the teacher. I know in my son's situation, um, in the cafeteria, there's a, uh, you know, a certain, so there are very long tables. And, and um, in the middle part of the cafeteria is where the, the, the cafeteria monitors, um, you know, walk back and forth during lunch. And William always sits towards that end so that if there is an issue, that they are able to help him. So just that type of thing. Um, reduced assignments. Again, I don't recommend going in for this because in my situation, my son has never needed a reduced number of assignments and so I wouldn't want to ask for it because then I'm limiting him and I'm making him feel different. Um, definitely, depending on the school that your child goes to, some schools have really strict attendance policies um, and truancy policies. And if your child goes through a period where they, you know, he may need to be hospitalized or may be not feeling well or whatever the case may be, you definitely want something in writing that they are going to have flexibility with that attendance policy and not be ready to kick him out of school because he might, you know, meet a certain number, you know, get to a, a threshold of a certain number of absences. Um, maybe something with transportation. I know that in our case, my son does ride the bus and his bus driver is very aware of what could happen and keeps my cell phone right by her cell phone. And she's also CPR and defibrillator trained, um, just in case, you know, that's needed. So, um, PE is another biggie. I think if you ask any kid, especially in elementary school and maybe in high school, what's their favorite part of the day, it's either the lunchroom or it's PE. Um, and so this is something that it's taken, you know, each year this is an important part of my son's 504 meeting in terms of what's PE going to look like for him. Well, for example, for him, it's written into his 504 plan that if he needs to rest, he just goes and sits down. He doesn't draw attention to himself. He's not punished. He just goes and sits down. Now, mind you, it hardly ever happens, but he has that option. Um, also, his um, PE teacher keeps a bottle of water in his little fridge for my son, um, just in case he gets thirsty or overheated, especially. Um, and, you know, another one is, and especially during, I don't know, you know, depending on where you're located in the country and, again, what type of school, I know at our school here in Georgia in August and September, that's when I worry about him the most is right when school starts back because, because it is so hot here. 
um, and they're out there on that playground. So another thing, and I'm just trying to give you some real world examples too. Um, you know, we have written into his plan that during those hot months, if he would like to, if he chooses to stay in during recess, he can, you know, go to the library and have some computer time or do something fun. You know, he doesn't have to sit there and do work. Or, you know, his teachers have always been so great. You know, he can go hang with another teacher or, um, you know, that kind of thing. But it's very important if you live somewhere where it's hot to keep that in mind in terms of maybe some school accommodations. Um, because gyms can be very hot and playgrounds can be very, very hot. Another big one that you might need to ask for, just depending on the layout of your school, is are there stairs? Are there a lot of stairs? You know, and then there's the book bags. Um, I brought this up in our 504 meeting this past summer before school started because for the first time my son was going to need to be on the second floor of the school. Um, and of course it never works out. His class is on the second floor so he has to walk up to the second floor when he first gets to school but when they go to their exploratories that's back on the first floor so then he does that and then he goes back to his class <laughs> then the cafeteria is on the first floor so he has to go. I think there's a total of either four or five times he has to go up and down you know it's a, a pretty big flight of stairs in a school um, and so we did have written into his 504 plan that if needed and if he requested he could ride the elevator. He's not made to, he's not singled out, and he's never asked to use that, but it's there just in case it was needed. Um, and then another thing is rest. And this was an issue in kindergarten for us, quite honestly, and not really since then. Um, and I think for any five-year-old, whether the five-year-old has bar syndrome or not, you know, that can be a struggle when a kid goes off to kindergarten re regardless. So that might be something to ask for. Um, if there could be a, a special place in the classroom, you know, no matter how old your son is, where it's not singled out and he doesn't even have to ask, but that he could go and get um, some rest. Like I know in our situation there was a special bean bag. Um, and so depending on the layout of the classroom, there's a place, if needed, you know, to just go and rest. Another one, and I don't think I have this one documented, but you know how a lot of times our boys are shorter than their peers. Um, one thing I had to ask for was his feet would dangle in his chair, and that got very tiring on his back and his muscles. And so we just got a little stool that went under his desk and that way he could sit there and put his feet up and it was so much better in terms of him getting tired. You know another one is he also has the the option if it's needed and it's not distracting to stand beside his desk because sometimes that's less tiring than sitting um, because it just takes so much core strength to sit there. So um, now again I've always approached this with him with him as you know, if at any point you become a distraction or use this, well, then it no longer becomes available to you because, you know, it's not there so that you can take advantage of it. Um, I know one other question is um, if the boy has trouble um, with fine motor skills and strength in terms of writing and might need a scribe or some other type of um, help to turn work in. You know, I, I realize at times this may, may be needed, but again, I caution against jumping to this um, because sometimes it, it can be the best thing possible to just have the teacher use some, some common sense and maybe limit, but definitely not move too quickly to a scribe or a computer or, you know, anything like that if it's going to be a possibility that he can um, gain that strength and... Um, and be able to write the same as his peers. Now I realize sometimes that can't happen um, and so when that happens definitely advocate for some type of situation um, because the last thing you want is him getting frustrated and so tired because of writing um, and quite honestly that has not been an issue personally for us at this point um, if anything his teacher this year really gets on him about his handwriting and I have to bite my tongue sometimes because I want to speak up and say, but don't you know? Um, but you know what? He's risen to the challenge and his handwriting's gotten a lot better this year. Um, but yes, I think it's really important that our sons don't 
don't take this as a this is a free pass to go lay down and not do my work or ride the elevator and goof off or you know we've always communicated that at the first sign of you taking advantage of any of these things that are in place for you they go away and then we'll have to figure out what you're gonna do so um, and again with technology this day and age going back to that point again there are so many things that can be used um, to assist with those fine motor skills if they are lacking or you know it's just a frustration point for him there's so so many so many things in place so if we look at um, what else you might ask for it's important to think about if your child is is going to have to take standardized tests like state tests um, you, got, you know these these can be very high stakes tests and they can last a really long time so um, a few things that you might want to think about asking for if your child is at a grade level where standardized testing might be needed would be frequent breaks um, being able to stand up and not sit down the whole time and also another thing that can happen through a 504 plan legally this cannot happen through an SST but it can happen in a 504 plan is it can be written in there and this is actually written into my son's plan that he marks the appropriate answer on the bubble sheet but that he doesn't use his strength sitting there darkening in every bubble perfect perfectly that there's actually his teacher with one witness can go back and darken in where he has made the dark mark because if not what tends to happen is if the hands get tired because that's such a you know a small thing to have to do over and over and over again um, what will end up happening is more than one circle will get darkened and then the child may have the right answer but it won't be keyed as the right answer so um, definitely think about standardized testing accommodations um, and just that fatigue factor if nothing else um, another thing you can definitely ask for is alternate ways to show mastery like if it's a long writing piece that they might could do a recording or a video or um, act it out in some type of dramatic performance you know sometimes um, there are a lot of times that teachers definitely think outside the, the box but sometimes they just have to you know sometimes you might say well could he instead and they're happy to let your son do that because it still shows that he's meeting the standards whatever they may be and that that he's gaining the knowledge so um, definitely I would advocate for having a water bottle near him most schools are pretty good about that these days um, but you know I'm not saying he needs to have red Gatorade that's gonna stain the carpet and make every teacher have a total freak out because that carpet only gets replaced every 20 years in a school but um a water bottle you know should definitely be an okay thing you definitely want an emergency plan if you don't have a you know a specific 504 plan or IEP, IEP in place in terms of who to contact what are the steps what would be done um, and this is a biggie for me because I know that sometimes in small schools um, that, that this may be more of a challenge but not just somebody in the child's school needs to be CPR trained, but your child's teacher needs to be CPR and defibrillator trained. Um, and you need to really push for that. Um, that's why starting in about, I've already got it on my calendar, in about two weeks I'll be um, sending an email to the assistant principal at my son's school saying, hey, have you thought about you know, his teacher for next year? Here, here are some things I'm thinking. You know, what do you think about that? Um, because I want to know in advance so that that teacher if she's not here she is not already trained can go get trained over the summer and I've never had a teacher say no to that they are always more than willing to get trained um, to help a child so and you know most local fire departments do that there are a variety of ways last year um, my son's teacher needed to be trained at his school and so they ended up making a school-wide training so anybody who was there at the school at the time stayed and got trained um, in CPR which was awesome because you never know when a child might need that um, we already talked about the alternate plan for recess during the heat this is another one that's been really important for us and this is actually in his 504 plan if any child in his classroom is sick his teacher emails me 
and she doesn't tell me who because that would be a breach of privacy confidentiality but she I just get a note that says via email you know two children were out today um, they were um, parents emailed they were throwing up last night or one child went home today with a hundred and one fever saying that he had a stomach ache she just gives me the details of what's going on so that if my son shows any symptoms that I'm able to pretty much say well this has to be related to what's going around at school so that I don't immediately have a freak out and feel like we need to rush off to the emergency room um, this has been very helpful um, and it's something that I insist on during that meeting in the fall is that she um, it's always been a she but she lets me know if anybody's sick and what she knows about it so just food for thought there um, because you know it really does have to be a team approach I know I just barely touched on this earlier but I really encourage you to um, to form a, a really tight close relationship with your child's school wh whatever type of school environment he might be in and as much as you can you know thank them appreciate them make them feel like things are their idea to be quite honest um, and and really be a part of that team not an outsider you know looking in because the school really 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 will appreciate that and will respond well to that okay so Julie can you hear me I can now <laughs> oh good all right good um what if a parent has a concern and they feel that their their son is you know the needs are not being heard so what what I remember with my son is that um, the homeroom teacher needs to be the coordinator of the uh, of, of care basically in in the educational process and um, let's say a family has a grievance how should they approach that should they go to the homeroom teacher should they go to the principal if they feel that their son is not being properly heard or if he's not you know let's say he needs to go to the restroom because he's on diuretics and you're saying you're you're taking advantage of uh, of the restroom breaks how how should that be handled okay great question and I'm glad you asked it first of all that would be a great if that's an issue your son has I would highly recommend that be put specifically into the plan that he be allowed to go to the restroom as needed again with the caveat that if you abuse this it will be taken away so um, if that situation presented itself the first thing I would do is make sure that my son is actually not taking advantage of the situation and if I deem that he is not it's always best and you're going to get in my experience the most favorable results if you first go to the person and make sure the person is aware of the situation and you know you you politely ask that you know that things change that you know as a reminder um, little Johnny has this in place and you know we, we need to make sure this is being met and then if there are any further issues then at that point you know I would contact either the counselor or the assistant principal if that still doesn't you know I would just make my way up the ladder um, because what tends to happen is if there is an issue which there very well could be and you go straight to the top you go straight to the principal or goodness gracious you call the superintendent's office or whatever the case may be then what ends up happening is a situation has been created where even though you're in the right and your son is not you know his needs might not be being met it has set up then a very adversarial relationship um, and that's not what you want for your son so I always recommend no matter what the grievance might be whether you know it doesn't really have anything to do necessarily with a boy having bar syndrome but you know if you have an issue in the classroom um, with your child with anything I always suggest go to the teacher first and then make your way 
make your way up and document you know even if it's a phone call follow up with an email as we talked about today I'm very concerned about you know and and make sure you keep that paper trail I think that's a good point so the we need to be a little bit more cognizant of the fact that this is going to be hard enough for the boys to be as normal as they can be, you know, and this is what we all want and, um, and not just necessarily to go right to the principal or the superintendent as soon as something happens. And, you know, it may be our normal reaction because I am the first to admit I have three children and almost identical things can happen with the other two and and I, I process and deal with it differently emotionally and I it doesn't mean I love him more it doesn't mean I I just you know there is a sense of urgency and it just a seizing in my chest when um, something happens with him mm -hmm. and darn it it's just that whole mother thing I guess but um I have to be very careful to not and I know this about myself. I have to be very careful to not jump the gun and come across too forceful when it comes to anything with him. I have to take that deep breath and think, would I act like this with my other two? No. Get control of yourself. That's a good point. You know, would I, if my son was healthy, would I behave the same way? That's a good point. Because again, you know, it goes back to what we talked about. They just want to be treated as normally as, as they can be. So to overreact or to to baby too much is not, I mean, you know, they're, they're going to quickly get old enough to pick up on that, and that's not going to make them feel very good. Thank you. Okay, so that's all I had prepared for this evening in terms of sort of examples and structure of what different intervention plans could look like. As I was talking, I did think of a couple of other random things that could be helpful, but of course right at the moment, I can't remember what they were. Um, they were spurred by um, a couple of different comments that were typed, and I thought, well, I need to remember that at the end. Um, <laughs> and now, of course, the brain is pretty much gone for the night so I'm sure I'll think about it in a moment you know preparing for college I think this is very important and again just remember that as he has his dreams and aspirations for what he wants to do with his life you know try not to treat it any differently than any other child that you might be raising in your household um, there's no reason why I mean look at what some of our boys within the bar syndrome foundation have accomplished and done um, look at what our very own who's here with us this evening has done and what he continues to do. He's an amazing inspiration. Um, I think it's so important though as, as he is getting ready to make that transition, it's going to be, you know, the same concept as when he went to elementary school or when he transitioned to middle school or transitioned to high school. You know, you've got to start looking all over again, but just in a little different way, but all over again at what's the environment going to be, what are the expectations going to be, um, what, what might be the, the hurdles or pitfalls in that college environment that we might need to address up front um, because remember the you know the Disabilities Act you know goes beyond just little people it applies to big people too so um, it's important to make sure that every opportunity is afforded to our boys because um, they have the the potential and the ability to attend college and be successful and have wonderful careers and lives just like anybody else so but again it's just that transition again you know I find that that's what's so hard in our situation it's when those transitions happen like I already if I think about he only has one more year of elementary school and then we've got to tackle like what to do in middle school are you kidding me um, and it, it, it brings back those same anxious feelings of when I was starting to think about him going to kindergarten. Um, it's the same exact thing, just a little bit of a different set of issues to, to overcome. So, you know, preparing for college is not going to be 
any different. It's those same feelings again of, you know, what do we do to, to, to set up for success? I don't know if I answered your question. I think, I think that what we need to do is that we need to consider what we would do if our, if our sons were healthy and to give them the best opportunity to have as healthy of an experience as they progress through school, but also our, our process in terms of advocating for them, there's additional challenges and there's a real fine line. And as hard as it is for us, we also have to consider how difficult it is for educators and for the people who, you know, this isn't their kid. And we're kind of educating them in the process as well and not consider consider them as ad adversaries, but as a part of the process and giving those boys as much normal, for lack of a better term, as we possibly can. Is that fair? I think that makes 100% sense. And, you know, if I could just say this, you know, before we... Before you make the decision as a parent to say no to something for your son or to think that it's not possible or to discourage him or steer him in a different direction from something, what, whatever it might be, you know, I just challenge you and encourage you to stop and ask yourself, am I reacting this way for myself or is it a true concern for him? Because I find many times as parents that our children are capable of a whole lot more than we necessarily want them to be because we want to protect them because it's part of being a parent. So um, before you go ahead and shut the door, whether it be on an activity or a sport or a school setting or friends or allowing him to go out and play or do, you know, anything, um, I just challenge you to, to stop and ask yourself that question. Am I saying no to this or am I steering him in a different direction truly for him or is it for me? Yeah, I think that's a good point. I think, I think as a parent, we, you know, a parent is naturally going to be as protective as possible, but our goal is to, give them the world and let them go and let them fly. And we can't let them fly if we're clipping their wings constantly. But, you know, we've got to, we've got to, there's a fine line between advocacy and, um, and being overprotective. And we've got to figure out the process and work within that process without scaring people to death. So are there any other? Okay, so yeah, that's what I was going to say. Sorry, Shelly. Are there any other questions or concerns or anything I haven't touched on or wasn't clear on? Um, I don't have any. So no other questions? All right. Well, I think we're good. Julie, I really appreciate this because I... Is a parent who has gone through this, I, I think that this is, you know, education is a really scary process and you're, there's a fine line between scaring people to death and trying to be that, you know, you're entrusting these educators with your kid's life and you don't have a choice but to send them to school. And it's, it's very frightening to find that fine line and to, say, and to go to work every day and know that somebody else is entrusted with your kid's life. And then sometimes there's, there's people who get it and sometimes there are people who don't. But you, you also don't want to overreact and you want to go, you know, you want to make sure that you don't alienate your son's, your son's educators and you don't want to, you don't want to overprotect him. It's, it's really, it's hard. It's, I think, I think educating a kid with bar syndrome is harder than educating a healthy sibling. I'm hoping. Well, and it's definitely a, a continuous process of, of, you know, finding that, that good balance. And one other thing that I didn't say that I wanted to say was, you know, this day and time compared to any other time, 
there are so many options too for education for our children that still allows them so much flexibility and, and normalcy in terms of you know online schooling and um, you know a lot of districts if there are times that it just might be needed temporarily there's you know homebound instruction if there's a period where that's needed and then your child can jump right back into a regular school setting when he can that there are so many things out there um, to be aware of um, through school districts and, and schools that are available that still allow your son to to be in that environment that he might want to be in, whatever that may be. Um, and schools typically, I find, are so willing to work with children when it comes to thing like things like that. I think online school online schools are something that are they're they're coming around, but it it is very helpful, and the educators are just as much in touch with the boys as they would be if they were in school too. And I think, you know, what, what sometimes what I've heard from families is that they're concerned that the educators that are online, the online educator are, are, are remote and they won't get the, um, the challenges that the boys get. But I, I don't, I don't think that's the case. I think there is in tune is if the boys were going to a public school system or a private school system. I agree, and as you know, you know my educational career for the past, um, what nine years has been in the online setting. And you know I work with a lot of kids who there are a lot of different reasons why people choose online education. And I definitely work with some kids, kindergarten through twelfth grade, who you know have medical conditions that lead them to this being the best choice. And um, it ends up being a, a great choice, and, it, and it's a very fulfilling and complete experience still. So it just totally, you know, there's no one right answer for any family, for sure. Absolutely. Well, Julie, thank you so much for your time and effort, and I really appreciate this. And if we don't have any questions, I, I'm going to close it out. But thank you tonight for your time. This has been very informative. Thank you, Julie. That was wonderful. Yeah, thanks, Julie. We meet yeah. probably within the next couple of months for kindergarten, so this is fantastic.